Thank you so much for having me. So um, I was listening to some of the speakers as I walked in. You see all these very well-renowned faculty and professors. And so I was reminded of a kind of opposite story. So when I'm starting a new venture or getting involved in something, I'll often go and get connected with my family, a lot of whom immigrated here from Punjab, northern India, and I'll try to explain what I'm doing to them. And you get some interesting answers. I remember when the dot-com days, the look of disappointment when I couldn't fix the CD drive on my uncle's computer. <laughs> right? And I had to try to kind of explain that that's not what I did. But they were like, well, let's hope he, you know, at least he, you know, he, he's at least a nice boy. Right? So then um, when I was explaining crowdsourcing a few years ago, I was talking to my family. And my uncle's like, oh, I get this. It's like in a village when there's a fire and we all grab a pail and we pour water on something. And my other relative's like, no, 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 no. It's like when you go to the market and there's a bunch of goats and they're all the same price and you pick the best one. And I was kind of like, yeah, OK, yeah, that's pretty much you've got a couple of the good models down. So I thought I would take this a little bit of a different direction with all of the, our, our friends here. And I saw Kareem was presenting. I almost just stole Kareem's presentation because he's presenting two after me. So I could have just totally cut him out. But I thought I would do a little bit different. I want to take a little bit of a step back and talk about thinking bigger and the purpose around innovation and how crowds come into that, and then get really specific on some of the examples that we've seen that are really kind of hitting this in the real world. So it's not something that's just about um, what's going through. Now, my, my, my background is my career has been in technology. I started my career at a really big company, ran software at a startup, joined um, the office of the CEO and corporate strategy at SAP, and then started Aperio. And when we started Aperio, our goal was to help enterprises kind of reimagine their business through new technology like cloud, social, and mobile. And over time, we said, look, we, wanna, we think that we can be as disruptive to the services and software industry as the software as a service and cloud providers are to the old legacy players. We started growing the company. We were doing really well. And it kind of dawned on me that at the time, we had about 500 people. And our biggest competitors were companies like Accenture and Deloitte. They have 250,000. So I did the math really slowly in my head and said, this is probably not going to work for us. Right? There's no way for us to grow. My grandkids will be um, you know, employees at the company before we get anywhere close to the scale we're needed. So there's got to be a different way. We've got all these things going on where for the first time there's platforms established in the industry that let us innovate and share in a different way. What else can we do? And so we started a crowdsourcing community um, and really used it to try to disrupt that, that supply chain. And then about six months ago, we said we were so excited about the space. We acquired Topcoder that's been doing this for 13 years and really has been a leader in the crowdsourcing space. And we were so proud to be able to join those communities together under the single umbrella of Topcoder. So that's basically a little bit about who I am and the perspectives that I'll bring to this. Let me jump into a little bit of what's happening from my perspective in the Valley. There's been a lot of articles like this lately where I think people get that innovation is happening, but people have kind of settled into a comfort zone that says, I am expecting innovation around certain ways. I'm actually expecting apps to go um, from zero to 10 million downloads in three days on the App Store. I'm expecting that to happen through Android. Software as a service, cloud providers, I'm expecting them to behave in a certain way and grow. So there's this thing where people have started to say, yes, innovation is moving fast, but they're getting comfortable with that. And some people are saying, well, that's not innovation anymore. Uh, the companies in the bottom left corner are companies that we work with pretty closely. Um, the common thing among those and most of the other software as a service vendors that are large and dominant is they were all started in 2005 or earlier. And so it brings to, to bear this notion of, have, has innovation slowing down, or are we at least falling into certain patterns of innovation? And I would actually surmise no, but I think you've got to broaden your lens of what, beyond what we normally think of in our software world, is innovation and technology. So um, a couple of my favorite examples, and I'll, I'll go through a couple of videos and a couple I won't. I, about everybody's heard of a Google car by now, right? I think every, anybody been in one? I was going to ask for help in getting myself into one. <laughs> um, I, I usually show a video around this, but in the interest of time, I won't go through that. But basically, you know, this is what the Google car sees. It sees you all around. And there's some great examples of how this is not just a cool technology toy. It's actually going to change how an industry behaves. For example, um, one of the great videos is a guy named Steve Mann who's actually blind. And they show him really getting independence back, being able to go to the dry cleaners and pick up Taco Bell because of the independence the Google car is bringing him, being able to go through that. Um, you look at industries like insurance, like what happens to the insurance industry when accidents don't happen? Warren Buffett just had his annual meeting, and it was shocking. This is Warren Buffett in Omaha at his annual meeting, and somebody asked him what he thought about Google cars and automated cars. And the awareness level to say, yeah, that is going to affect our industry, but you know, these things take more time than we think was really interesting. So you're seeing this notion of what seems like a cool techie experiment that this crazy company in Mountain View did to actually having pretty profound exposure and experience to an industry. We spend more time in our cars each day than we do on Facebook. 
What an opportunity for attention. What about what happens when your car is no longer a mode of transport, but a proxy for your office or your living room? So very different set of things where we think about this. Now these will bring controversies, despite the fact it's pretty proven that cars are, automated cars are safer than what you would drive because they don't text while they drive, they never drink and drive. So by default, they're already way safer than, than the majority of people. But people really don't like it when robots kill them. So the first time one of these cars get in an accident, we're gonna see all sorts of societal issues and how we actually deal with this. So the issue will just be this kind of colliding notion of technology and society, which I'll talk about in a second. So um, I'm kind of into robots lately, so I saw this one, and I, and I thought this was an interesting piece. I'm going to show a video of a couple of my favorite robots for a second. Number 10, Honda's Asimo. The humanoid robot stands a bit over four feet and weighs in at 119 pounds but its developers have packed a whole lot of functionality into its modest frame. Osmo can do sign language, play soccer, and even serve drinks. Number nine, Karatis. If you ever dreamed of being the pilot of a great big robot, this is your chance. Located within its 13 foot tall frame is enough room for an onboard commander. Oh, by the way, it can be controlled with an iPhone. Number eight, Atlas. Commissioned by the Pentagon and engineered by Boston Dynamics, this disaster rescue dynamo is built to perform the heroic task of saving lives without risking its own. Number seven, termite robots. These little guys are designed to do tough, tedious building work and their way of working was inspired by termites. The bots assess their environment, take cues from one another and get to work even though they haven't a clue of the bigger plan. Number six, cheetah cub. Wanting to know how to make robots take control of tough terrain with the grace of a feline, scientists at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology made a robotic cat. Using it, they can assess joint force and agility without having to harm an actual animal. Number five, Wildcat. Not to be confused with the aforementioned cheetah cub, the Wildcat is the newest generation of Boston Dynamics cheetah robot line. These machines are made for speed, traveling up to 29 miles per hour. While previous versions were indoor sorts, this one is suited to run free. Number four, VGo Virtual Student. Stuck at home with a severe immune disorder, a student in Texas is now able to attend classes thanks to a robot. She can power the virtual version of herself via internet and participate in what's going on thanks to a webcam. Miranda suffers from a weak immune system that doesn't allow her to attend class in person, but thanks to this robot pilot program, she's back in the classroom. Number three, RoboFly. It's tiny and fast, weighing only 80 milligrams and flapping its wings up to 120 times per second. Once technology advances and can make it a battery small enough, the robotic insect is predicted to be a helpful tool in search and rescue missions. Number two, the Mab. It flies around your house, senses where it's dirty, and then deploys a bunch of tiny little cleaning bots to make the area sparkle. It's just a concept, but was enough of one to win the Electrolux Design Lab competition. Number one, Curiosity. NASA's Mars rover has accomplished far more than any other robot can imagine, so to speak. It's only been on the red planet for about a year and a half, but has already determined that there could have once been life there. If you could design a robot. So, you know, kind of a fun thing around robots. It's interesting, like, because a lot of the things that we thought of as science fiction, I mean, we've been talking about robots for 20 years, but all of a sudden they're not only becoming available, but becoming available at a very low price point. Anybody have a Roomba, one of those little vacuum cleaners robots? Mm -hmm. A couple of them. There's a study out that a third of the people name their Roombas, but I won't ask that question of any of you guys because you often get a sheltered response. But you're seeing all sorts of capability and expansion because these are becoming more mainstream. But with them, there's all sorts of risk as well. When I see the little robot that's smaller than a quarter, I think spying. Um, one of the biggest things you see when you talk about robots is recently, you know, this notion of what happens to an industry where now robots are replacing people. A number of the robots um, actually will learn what you're doing. So if you actually go and show them how to assemble a part, they will mimic the, the learning action of a human and do that same action. And so Google teaming with Foxconn to potentially build robots could mean manufacturing comes back to the U.S., but also has a pretty dramatic effect on what's out there. The, um, the robot that was the, the, the child in school is actually um, a commercial version of that. It's from Suitable Tech called Beam. It's the top left there. CES next year is going to have a thousand of those things. And so you can just dial your way into CES over the internet, wander around, get control, see what sessions you want to experience, but not have to go to Vegas or jump on a plane. So pretty tr dramatic effects that you're seeing here. And again, it's not just these couple of fields. Like, you know, I, I go through this often. This room, I'll ask how many people know. Chocolate covered rows, a band, um, braces, and shoes. What do they have in common? Raise your hand if you know. A few. Anybody want to shout it out? 3D printing. 3D printing, yes. 
everything on this screen is 3D printed. So I always, I'm not a musician, but the band idea, I was thinking, can you make a 3D printed instrument that will make me sound good on the guitar? That's still a little bit beyond technology. But the idea that you can configure it to the room and the ac acoustics that you're looking for, really making it configurable. The bottom right, the Nike Vapor shoes were, have parts that were 3D printed in them, um, made for the Super Bowl this year. All the winning teams wore them. Seven of the 10 fastest times at the N NFL Combine were with these shoes. They're able to manufacture things that they really just couldn't do previous to 3D printing. So really not just, not just replicating what we've done, but changing the structures of what we're creating. Invisalign with braces, half a billion dollars sold, all of them are 3D printed. Really huge opportunity for the company to really quickly jump into that space, but also potential disruption. What if the dentist office just has a printer on their own? Do they need Invisalign anymore? And then even food, chocolate covered roses, different colored sugars, being able to at a pixel by pixel level design the food flavor that you want in a particular piece. It's a whole new set of culinary pieces. So all sorts of different things around that. And of course, with 3D printing, you can't even search the term on Google without quickly seeing guns. So again, a massive society impact wow. around that, which has huge risk to society, but also equally huge benefit. The prosthetic um, implications of 3D printing are really profound. Being able to really give dignity back to people, not just giving them functional form, but being able to actually allow them to customize their 3D printed uh, prosthetics to what they want. If you get a hip replacement in the UK, it's probably 3D printed. I think our FDA will get around to that at some point as well. But being able to go through and really profoundly change how you're manufacturing different places. And I could kind of go on and on. Wearables, um, we're seeing massive things around that, the amount of data that it will create, what it means to be able to instrument yourself. Um, genomics, you can, you know, the first uh, the sequencing of the human, human gene, 13 years, $3 billion. You can get your own done for about $1,000 this year, $100 within a year. Imagine walking into your doctor with a memory stick and saying, this is me, figure it out, all right? A little different way. And then of course, kind of computers, we're seeing all of a sudden AI advance at rates that we hadn't seen before. The, the picture on the bottom there is a quantum computer, 10 meters square to cool a one centimeter chip to minus 270 degree Kelvin for it to operate. So maybe not quite practical yet, but getting there. And a potential to be 4,000 times faster on certain problem sets than current computing in space. So we're seeing this again and again. So if, as you kind of widen your lens from the notion of building an app on the App Store or the Android marketplace, you start seeing the breadth of what's possible with innovation. But there's another side to this. One of my favorite blog posts, I'm sure everybody here has read this, is from Mark Andreessen in the Wall Street Journal where he talks about software eating the world. And it's a really great piece and it talks about you know, the disruption of Blockbuster via Netflix and you know, Borders and Amazon, really a software-centric view. But if you take a step back and walk through what I just walked through, you start seeing that this is a broader statement. All of a sudden, the world is becoming programmable. I remember when cloud computing first occurred, I was so excited because I grew up as a technologist and I used to hate when the customer would ask me, well, how much hardware do I need? What's the networking setup? I didn't know anything about that, but I knew how to create software. Well, now all of a sudden, it's not just that the cloud has abstracted software out. We're seeing all of these interfaces to life in 3D printing and artificial intelligence and robotics that is abstracting the world into a software pro program. You can really program the world now. And at the same time, obviously data is exploding. Like you're seeing data creation going crazy because of this. Every element of what I talked through is creating a profound set of data. We're not exactly sure what to do with in all circumstances, but it's there. So you're seeing this notion of you've got all this innovation occurring, which is basically creating an API to the world. You've got data going everywhere, but at the same time, we have all this stuff about, you know, regardless of what you think about whether there is a shortage or not, certainly there's areas where we're seeing skills issues around IT, around data science, around mobile, that's really constraining different pieces out there. So you're seeing all these factors comply at works. All of a sudden, if you're a shoe company in Minnesota, are you competing with Facebook for talent? How do you actually kind of manage through all that? So basically, we're seeing more than ever this up or out of an industry level. Before, it was like your company could get disrupted and you wanted to be on one side of it. Now you're seeing this happen at an industry level. A lot of the things I talked about and others are putting pressure on it. And so if you're an executive at a large company, let's just pick a boring old manufacturing company, all of a sudden, you really got to care about 3D printing because your company or your industry can disappear. And then you're in a software problem, and now you're in a skills problem. So, Basically, you know, this is the crux of getting to what, what TopCoder provides, what we think about with crowdsourcing, this notion of being able to tap into a world of talent because there's no way you can keep up. We came to this realization at Aperio, and that's why we invested so much in crowdsourcing and the TopCoder community. TopCoder is a community of about 620,000 designers, developers, and data scientists today. Kareem will talk about some of the work we've done with um, 
uh, kind of long rolling with the incredible results that you'll see with this kind of crowdsourcing approach, I'm going to hit on some of the really specific results and what happens with customers. So how does it actually apply so you can see that it's not simply a, a something that's theoretical but really practically possible now. So this is a, a discussion of around, there's a company called Brevo Labs. They make door security. I can't think of too many things that are more boring than door security, right? But they figured out a way to make it a little bit different. So let me, let me walk through a quick video first to give you an example of what I mean. So let's figure out how to make wearables come into the physical world. So they basically said, look, we really want to make building security not boring. We want to make it social. We want to connect it to wearables. We have no idea how to get the skills to that. Like, we don't have Google Glass developers. We don't have people who understand the social platforms out there. We do, we do badges, right? So they said, by tapping into a crowdsourced community, I'm able to get skills that I might not have, create wearable interfaces to our technology, create iPad applications, and eventually create an API to the physical world that they through the community that then they could use through a community to create interesting solutions. So really kind of an interesting way of bringing this physical world into another by being able to tap into the skills that let them do that. I'm getting the rush of time here. So a couple of other ones. Um, everybody likes NASA. Right now we have a, a program underway with NASA. Um, if you go to topcoder.com forward slash asteroids, you'll see it. And you can even play asteroids on the site. But basically it's helping NASA figure out how to detect asteroids for mining purposes or to make sure they don't hit us, improving the algorithms by which they do that. So it's a massive image detection problem that they're able to tap into a community to go through. We just finished this. The first phase, we had 400 plus submissions from across the world to help them figure out how to improve this piece of this. Similarly, with NASA, we're working on something called disruption tolerant networking, an internet protocol basically for space. So astronauts can get emails, so devices and robots can communicate with people in space. The protocol by which communication can occur, and they decided the best way to do this was by crowdsourcing it, because even someone as advanced as NASA recognizes that the world's innovation is a more powerful factor. You know, commercial companies like Comcast, this is data from the last about 18 to 24 months of Tom Comcast, where we've had over 11,000 people from 72 countries participate in almost 700 challenges. I think it represents about 25 projects and 155 unique winners that have added the R&D capacity of Comcast and able to, being able to produce their components and solutions around their Xfinity platform. So really being able to say, how do you use this as a part of a virtual development capacity for what you're doing across the world? Um, HP, Idle on Demand, we basically went through, they're looking to how do, how do I promote what we, what we have around this? I'm actually going to skip this one, but you'll get a sense of what we're doing. We're, we're taking products that have APIs to connect to interesting things that are intelligence and saying the best way of creating those and exposing those is by being able to go through and use a community. So again, pushing through a community. Um, I'm running out of time a little bit, but let me talk about the design process, because these are, you know, yeah, great. You can help me find asteroids. How do I actually train that into something for my company? Well, one of the things we do is, like, how do you make it quick to access the crowd? So this is something we do on the design side, where we let people have all sorts of variants and say, I need some designs that can help me build a mobile app, for example. They'll get a bunch of designs. They'll give feedback at a checkpoint and narrow in on a solution. So they allow for variants through the community early on, and then they provide collective feedback to everybody that lets them actually get to a particular um, solution for them. We've even done this in a very short period where we'll simulate a, a whiteboarding session. In this case, it was like play some charades, um, pick the category, so they pick the the wheelbarrow from Monopoly, so we said, let's build a landscaping app. The green team won, so we said, let's use green colors. 
we launched a challenge in 25 hours. So we launched the challenge, expected results back in 25 hours, and got about a dozen designs for a green mobile landscaping application that we were able to go through and see very quickly. So this is just a couple of those. So really looking forward to being able to tap into the world in a different sense from the world's hardest problems to the ones that are super common and around. Anybody know who this is or who the quote's from? Kareem Vazira, see me do this. It's William Gibson. It's the guy who wrote Neuromancer. And um, it's a big cyberpunk novel, novel. One of the first. He coined the term super, uh, cyberspace. And I really think it captures where we're at with innovation and how crowds can help. We're seeing more than ever that the future really is already here. It's just the distribution is uneven. And that's going to create chaos across multiple industries for people for a long time because we've stretched that curve out. So how you use communities and crowdsourcing to tap into that provides a different kind of labor model that allows an organization to keep up with what's impossible to keep up with, which is the pace of innovation today. So with that, thank you guys for the time and look forward to questions again.